Okay, welcome to the Sumer Sports Show Monday edition. We've had uh, a couple weeks where we've only had one version of this show. That'll that'll change uh, this week. We'll have our Wednesday show again. I'm Eric Eager. I'm one of the VPs at Sumer Sports. I'm joined by the CEO of Sumer Sports, Thomas Dimitrov. We've had a busy few weeks, Thomas, and yet I don't get it. the NFL hasn't slowed down for us, right? Mm-hmm. Like they just keep going, they keep playing the games. Don't they know that we have a ton of shit to do at, at Sumer every single day, and yet they keep playing the games, Thomas? Uh, how, how was your weekend? Weekend was good. I mean, got a chance to see some really cool football, I think. It was cool. I don't know. I'm, sometimes I feel like I'm settled in. I don't know about you, and I just want to get on my sofa and watch the whole day, and then things get me going different ways. You and I start texting back and forth, and you get me all riled up, especially when you start texting about the Falcons. You really get me riled up. So I took deep breaths and steered clear of the Falcons game this weekend. Did a lot more of updating, watching a lot of the highlights on it, to be honest with you. Yeah, that one was tough. Like, um, so for one, we we didn't have internet at my house for like three straight days. Like somebody came in and like was doing work excavating around the neighborhood or whatever. I come home one day, there's no internet. So I'm sitting here watching Thursday night football on my phone. I'm like going to the gym, not to like work out, you know, but to like actually go and watch, uh, you know, the Mac championship on Saturday morning. We finally got it back Saturday night, just in time to watch Florida state versus Louisville. One of the better defensive performances uh, I've ever seen uh, by Mike Norvell's team. And then we find out that Sunday morning, they're not making the college football playoff. It ends up being Michigan, uh, Washington, Texas and Alabama, Alabama team, Thomas, that needed a Hail Mary to beat Auburn just the week before did not look like a college football playoff caliber team, but they make it uh, your uh, old colleague, uh, Nick Saban uh, and his bunch, a wild weekend, even to lead in, uh, you know, to the uh, Sunday of football, Dylan here, uh, one of our frequent listeners, go horns. Um, Yeah, it was, it was crazy. And then, yeah, we get to this Jets game, right? 13-8, 13-8, we saw some of Nick uh, Tim Boyle, we saw some of Trevor Simeon, we saw all of uh, Desmond Ritter in his glory. Falcons move to 6-6. Six and six. They now have a one-game lead over New Orleans, who lost at home to Detroit, as well as uh, Tampa Bay, who won against Carolina, but only by three. That division remains a privilege. But the news of today, Thomas, is the Jets wanting to go back to Zach Wilson and he reportedly being hesitant about wanting to reclaim that starting job. How? What are we doing here? Like, how are we, how does this thing happen? What are we doing here? You know, when that was going around way back, early part of the season, there was discussion about him as well as Ritter, right? How do you yank them and put them back in? To me, it comes back to something you and I've talked about before. It comes back to mental toughness. It comes back to, you know, perseverance, you know, how you're going to deal with the tough times because there's going to be tough times. There's going to be good times. I'm sure for, you know, the Jets and the way things are, are playing out here, a quarterback in New York, all that stuff that went on with, with, uh, you know, a Achilles tendon being blown and Aaron Rodgers now I got the I'm at the helm again and then I get yanked. I get yanked twice basically because they put someone else in, two other people, and now they're knocking on the door to go back to him. Is that an instance of a lack of mental toughness? Or is it just it's just a little too far, gentlemen? I can't be relegated twice again and then brought back on to the to the front page. What is your thought on that? Because I, I have spinning thoughts about it, to be honest with you. Yeah, I'm I'm a little weirded out. I, I so you know I came of age as a football person, knower, you know, watcher, kind of mid '90s, right? And in the mid '90s, you still had this happen all the time. Maybe not as much as before, but you had, you know, and I'm going to go back a little bit further. But I've studied league. You had New Orleans, for example, bench Bobby A. Bear you know, for three games and then just start him again the next year. Uh, the Eagles, Randall Cunningham, they put Randall Cunningham on the bench for ineffective play and then just started him the next year. And like, there are breaking points. You can't get benched all the time, but like, 
I always joked, you know, the Vikings game happened on Monday after before we did our show, and like Josh Dobbs is playing horribly. They could have gone to Nick Mullins or something. I'm like, Jerry Burns. You remember Jerry Burns? We, we watched uh, yeah. his press conference. Jerry Burns would have yanked Josh Dobbs so fast. He, you know, he had uh, Tommy Kramer was a pro bowler, Wade Wills, and they went back and forth between those guys. And I, I feel like now with the financial investments the way that they are, with free agency the way it is, you know, we just don't see that as much. But we did see it in Atlanta. Like Desmond Ritter was put on the bench for two weeks. They lose two games to backup quarterbacks. And then they go and they put, or not even backups, uh, in the case, you know, the Falcons lost to the Vikings with a backup and they lost to Arizona who brought uh, Murray off the bench for the first time all year. And, you know, they go back to Ritter and they're, you know, they've won the last two games. All is fair in love and war. I think with Wilson, it's really tough because this would, they've replaced Wilson three times, right? Last year, second half of the year, they're seven and four. They're starting to slide. They go with Mike White. They bring in Rodgers. Wilson gets the the ball back because, you know, of of circumstances as we talked about. They go back to Wilson, they 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 remove Wilson, and now they want to go back. I do wonder if that's a little too much, but at the same time like maybe I'm old school, but I mean, when's the next time Wilson's going to get a chance to start an NFL game, Thomas? Well, I don't know that because my my mind went right to who is his agent? Do you do you know by chance? I was trying to look it up here. Uh, looks like oh, it's Brian Ayrault. Ayrault's a uh, guy, by the way, that represented a number of g- different general managers. He's a tough ass. He's from Buffalo. You know, he's got a really strong opinion about how he's going to manage his players and support his players and represent his players. And uh, I can imagine that he's probably dissuading him from you know being knocked around like a you know, a ping pong ball, probably, because he wants to make sure that, you know, the kid has an opportunity to play in this league, right? And most people would say, well, that means get back on the field, throw some balls, win some games. That's how you're doing it, right? And Yeah, I but I I worry, though, right? Because I I get the Jets offensive line is is not very good. They're they're banged up the receiving core. I don't think the receiving core is not salvageable, though. Like Garrett Wilson's a top 10 pick, a pretty good ball player. You know, Brees Hall's a good player. Uh, Conklin, he's not too bad at tight end. Like, I don't I don't think that this is an offense that doesn't have talent. I think, you know, that the Hackett thing's interesting, right, where I think people are rightfully questioning whether or not he can call plays at a high level. But I, I bring it back. Like, I mean, you're somebody who, you know, you're you're – you're talking about, you know, we're, we, you, you know, you and I are talking about college quarterbacks kind of at the office. And I think talent level is not a huge, like talent is a huge part of it, but it's not, it, it, it's not a big part of it relative to like running back. If a guy's a, if a guy's a douche at running back, like, you know, but he can, he can play the game really well. That's tolerable. If a guy has terrible disposition at quarterback. Like people are going to ask that question. Right. So I I get that there's some safety issues obviously, but I I just don't know how Zach Wilson comes back from this now that it's leaked. Okay. So go to quarterback, talk about the quarterback. Okay. Where is he talk about a general manager? We already talked about him right last week and a a head coach. This is uh, did you see the scathing uh, report? I forget who it was by. It, it was it was someone in the media that was taking a major shot at at you know where a head coach and how a head coach can approach things with such passion like he did early on and now he's almost yeah. devoid of passion. Did you read that article out there? Yeah, it was it was it was a very um, it was a very interesting discussion about this. Robert Salah has been you know like you watch him on the sideline of games and it's broken him to an extent, right? You're talking about a guy who's, you know, jacked up and he's, he's out there with that Niners defense and patting people on the back and they're going to the Super Bowl and all this stuff. And even like last year, they, they start seven and four, they go to Lambeau field, they get a big win, all this stuff. And when, from the moment Rogers Achilles snapped, you could just sense like on the sideline, he's almost like pale, right? Like he's just like sitting there, like, what am I supposed to do? And it's part of the whole interesting discussion with a a team like Buffalo as well, where it's like, 
I don't think Sean McDermott's a bad coach in any stretch, but has the cer- have the circumstances required a, a, a re-racking of who we're going to get at that position because it's just like sometimes it's just like irreconcilable differences for lack of a better term. And like, I think that you see that somewhat in the New York Jets right now where it's like, if you're back a quarterback who you've given a golden opportunity to, no, they didn't have to have Zach Wilson be the backup this year. That was of the goodness of their heart to a certain extent. And he's going to look that kind of gift horse in the eye and be like, yeah, I don't really want, actually want to play for you anymore. I, I That is a tough one. That's a tough one. And again, I mean, that team right now, I've said this before, I think Rob or um, um, Jeff Ulbrich is a dynamite defensive coordinator. He's doing a heck of a job. They played, I mean, that was such a an ugly game, just again, by my own admission, I couldn't watch the whole thing. But, I, you know, as I caught up on it, I was thinking about, can that team, does that team have an ability to pull out any semblance of playoff opportunity in your mind? Do they have the makeup? Meaning defensively, they're tough asses, right? They're flying around, yeah. they're doing what they're doing. Offensively, it's all over the place as we as we've discussed. You know, where's Robert? Where is his coaching staff? Who's his, who's his, who's his, um, his uh, uh, offensive coordinator, right? Yeah, Nate, Nathaniel it's, Hackett. It's, yes, it's, it's Hackett, of course. But the rest of that group in there, are they, are they ready to bring, you know, to bring this team forward to make sure that they have a, a chance to possibly get in? And, I, you know, and Aaron Rodgers, back to him very quickly, just jumping around. Does Aaron really come back? Does he think he has a chance to come back? If by chance they have an opportunity to get in the playoffs, because he also mentioned oh, only if I can get in the playoffs would I really yeah. push this. Um, we 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 see we see them with only a two out of a thousand chance of making the playoffs, so 02 percent. So it's 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 not going to happen. Um, I think that you know I think a lot of questions have to turn to next year with them. It's to say if you if you were to and and I think it's not a terrible case. Like if you were to go to the Johnsons and be like, hey. If we had Aaron Rodgers all year, look at how great our defense was and look how close we were in some games, right? They were very close in a lot of games. Uh, there were some games, you know, like yesterday, they probably win handily if they have Aaron Rodgers. The yeah. Kansas City game on Sunday Night Football, they probably uh, win if they have Aaron Rodgers. And so, you know, right now, what's really tough in the AFC is you have, obviously you have, you know, Jacksonville tonight, Baltimore, Miami are all going to be nine and three. Kansas City's at eight and four. And then you have this like collection of seven and five teams, you know, Houston, Indianapolis, uh, Cleveland, Pittsburgh. And then you have six and six teams like Buffalo. And yeah. it's like you're getting you're so far down the list right now in the AFC. Yeah. And 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 I look and I think about teams like, you know, Indianapolis planned on having Anthony Richardson all year. He doesn't play much more than two, two and a half games. And Gardner Minshew has that team, right? A team that was dead last year giving up 33 point leads to Kirk Cousins and the Vikings and now they're going to be in the playoffs you have Houston right with your guy they were talking and I you know I'm not trying to speak out of turn here because I know you guys are friends they were talking about Nick Casario like he's a sitting duck and now that team's in the playoffs right like every you I I think it's tough because it's not only a magnitude situation it's a direction situation not only are the Jets struggling but a lot of teams in the AFC that we didn't expect to be any good, Cleveland, Pittsburgh even, are are much better. And they're dealing with, in the case of Pittsburgh now without their quarterback, Cleveland without their quarterback, Indianapolis without their quarterback, they're dealing with the same things the Jets are, right? Like, which is that they don't have their starting guy. And I think if you want to make the case that, okay, if we had Aaron Rodgers, we'd be winning, you have to look at the rest of the conference and say, well, wait a sec, Indy doesn't have their quarterback and they're winning. You know, Cleveland doesn't have their quarterback and they're hanging on for dear life. Why Why are we in the bottom half of the AFC right now? We could sit here and talk on and on about the Jets, but just flip over to Atlanta for a second because I'm curious. Uh, I think Desmond Ritter threw for 120 yards, right? I believe it was 100 mm-hmm. plus a 20-yarder that he, he, he uh, skimmed down the middle, I think it was. Can can a can a team like Atlanta, even if they were sub five hundred, and they're they're in charge of that division? I mean, that division is all over the place, of course. Yep. Um, 
can in your mind, I mean, statistically, how and this you, you have to come back to this, but how many times does a quarterback with sort of that low level of production do they take their teams, even if they edged in, have they taken their teams beyond? Like, have they hit a second gear once they got to the playoffs? And you could ask me that from my perspective. You, I'm asking you from yeah. a day. It's, it's, just a, it's a bad gamble, Thomas, right? Like, you might win one playoff game. Like, I think about, like, Brock Osweiler when he was with Houston. They won. But that in that Oakland team they faced, they were on quarterback number three by the time they got to playoffs. So, like, I don't think that's sustainable. You think about like Jimmy Garoppolo, but that's a that's a super franchise, the the Niners. But like Garoppolo is probably the closest comparison you have to a guy like Ritter. I mean, they, if they win the division, and right now we have about sixty one percent to win the division per Sumer Sports. If they win that division, they're going to face either Dallas or Philadelphia in the first round of the playoffs, and I just don't think that that's going to be pretty at all. And that's and that's the biggest part about this is like last year, for example, Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay wins that division with a uh, below 500 record. They face Dallas in the first round. Dallas, by the way, not a perfect football team last year, but they went into at Tampa Bay and killed them. Remember when Dallas went in there and missed four extra points and still beat the brakes off of Tampa Bay in that game. So, like, no, I think the answer is, like, unless you have a super team and a super coach, you're not winning much in the, in the NFL with, without at least, like, top 12 quarterback play. And, you know, I don't think the Falcons come anywhere close to that. And, and to me, then the question is, is like, what was this all for then? Why did we take one year of Des? Like, why, why was there not a better option than Ritter for the Falcons is, is maybe a good question. Cause I, I think I look at the rest of the team and it's not perfect. It's not great, but it's clearly being held back by the quarterback. So then you look at it and you start thinking, okay, how, how does the right in the middle potentially, right? Let's just say, they did get to the playoffs. They're picking right in the middle. That becomes, you have to be very creative with how you're going to get up to get one of these top five ostensible quarterbacks. There's some interesting quarterbacks, by the way, in the college ranks. We'll get to talking about that a lot into the future, of course, but are they're going to have to be very creative and aggressive potentially to get up there, right? This is a really interesting thing for them. How do they, you know, how do they get a, a real shot at, at you know, at picking their next starter for years and years to come. And is Desmond Ritter ultimately okay with taking a step back and being a, a legit backup for this team who, you know, look, one thing I know about Arthur Blank, he always, and I told you this, he always hammered me on where is our backup, right? And, and then mm -hmm. when we ended up, we ended up pulling some guys in there. I mean, we just, it was one of those discussions we had all the time. You never know, but we got spoiled again with Matt Ryan not getting injured. But if, you're, if your starter's not playing well, you need a legit backup. And, of course, Desmond Ritter has ability to pull people out of games if it's in the right situation. So, I don't know. This could be something that, that gives them opportunity to look ahead and say, all right, let's make sure we're covering ourselves for, for years to come here. Well, I think Washington also has that with Howell, who has yeah. played good, okay football, but, it, that, you know, is leading the NFL in sacks taken and interceptions, which is like a bad combination. Uh, you know, do do you bring somebody in and then try to bridge? I mean, we saw that in San Diego way back in the Marty Schottenheimer days where, you know, they made a decision on Drew Brees. They go and get Rivers. Rivers holds out a trip. People forget this part. Rivers holds out a training camp long enough where Brees hangs on to the job and he makes a Pro Bowl or two, right? And then you're kind of in no man's land. Do you do that? I think that's one of the reasons, Thomas, why a lot of these teams don't have two options because they get stuck in a situation. Think about this, and we're gonna let, let's segue into this for a little bit as well. The Green Bay situation, where you have a young guy who's drafted at the same time as the as the Hall of Fame guy, and the and the young guy has to sit for a bunch of years. Thomas, you know this, like the the Packers, who just off of a great performance last night, not only by Love but by the whole team they have to make a decision on what to do with Jordan Love's contract now. And that decision is going to be based on probably half a season now of really good football for Jordan Love. And the last time that we saw an NFL team make a decision on a young first round quarterback off of less than a full season's worth of work were the New York Giants four years, 160 million to Daniel Jones. And so 
this is probably the genesis, Thomas, of one of the reasons why teams don't necessarily like to kind of have one quarterback for a while and then have a young guy in the wings because those the, the decision clock on a young guy is fairly quick. And if, if you don't make a decision, you could be in an awkward situation like the Giants were this, this past season and the Packers are going to be this offseason. Well, look, the, the courage that Brian Gutekinds has with going with Jordan Love, that's a big deal, right? All the stuff that he went through bantering with, with Aaron and such. But, you know, we're still talking about, at least as it, as it plays out to this point, a middle-of-the-pack quarterback, right? Do you think he's number 15, 16, 17, 18? Where do you think he is? Um, so the way the league is shaping up, I think – Love probably has, this sounds insane to say, but Love has top five upside. But I think average right now, his average performance is probably 13 to 15. Yeah, right now. Wow. Did you just say he has top five upside? Okay. I uh, I, I respectfully disagree with that, but but I've been hard on him. I've been hard because I want to see more. I like what he's doing. I'll give him credit. I'll give Matt LaFleur credit for playing with him the way that he needs to play with him. He had some tough games, as you know. Yeah. He's hitting well, stride. Very bad. At I think they're getting, you know, nice confidence. It's tough for me because, again, having been with Matt Ryan and, and it was a lot of arguments. Was Matt ever a top five quarter? To be a top five, man, that is a big, big deal. That said, it's not in, in today's world, right, where we start talking about the, the down. Who the guys actually the are? Right. Right, Right. because like when Matt was playing, he was competing with Roethlisberger, Breeze, uh, Rivers, uh, obviously Manning and 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 uh, Brady, and then Mahomes at the end. And like like you look like I I, we've talked about this a few times, but I and and maybe that's where like the 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 what I say I have to say he's top like he's not top five in 2018, right? Where all those guys I just referenced were still in the league. But you look at the quarterback position right now, Thomas. Okay, Mahomes, Allen, Herbert, Burrow, Dak. Yeah, so it's tough. You know, I'm, like I'm, where where are the top five guys in the NFL? I is, guess is, the ones you just yeah. read, and yet I start thinking about seven, eight. I'm thinking he's more just on the other side of maybe he he gets on the other side of ten. More. Maybe it's more nine, eight. Maybe it's more nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Again, you're right. This is a different group of players for sure. It's just and, and you never and you hope, right? You hope if you get a draft class of Caleb Williams, Drake May, uh, who's the the kid, uh, Jaden Daniels, Jaden Daniels, you yeah. know, uh, you know, Michael Penix Jr., Bo Nix, you know, you you get that group into the mix and three of them work out. Then all of a sudden, now you know, Trevor Lawrence, like that draft where they went Lawrence, Wilson, Fields, Jones, yeah. and uh, you know. That class, you know, was supposed to – Trey Lance, that class was supposed to produce more than one good quarterback, but it only produced one good quarterback. So, and whereas 2020, you had Herbert pretty good, Burrow pretty good, two is, you know, okay, I would say. And now, you know, but, like, you need a couple more of those drafts because the quarterbacks are retiring faster than they're being produced at, at that top-end level. So, I mean, if you gun to my head, I think – Jordan Love's probably firmly a top 12 guy if you at the equilibrium. And I think if you look about absolute ceiling where that arm talent, athleticism, and all that jive, then I think you can talk about him kind of in that conversation with Dak. But even now, do you you don't like Dak Prescott is like I hope that hopefully I don't get in trouble here. Dak Prescott is like a poor man's Matt Ryan, right? Are you getting in trouble for me or by the by like, you? like I think so Matt Ryan to your point is like kind of in that five to ten range for me, right? For when when he was playing, you're talking about a guy who MVP of the league one year, bottom bottom his worst years, like you think about like you know, 2017, you think about 2013, the years where he was struggling, still a top 10 guy. At the very peak, he's in that top five conversation. Uh-huh. I think Dak Prescott's kind of like that kind of like Dak Prescott right now is playing about as well as like a an 80 percentile Matt Ryan year. Like I think Matt Ryan and Dak are kind of in that like similar group where there's limitations there, but they're very good. And I think Matt Ryan's a better version of Dak, if that makes sense. 
I kind of put Jordan Love in that, that that Dak category. So he's like a step below Matt. At the very peak, I think Jordan Love can be that player. I don't know if he'll reach it, and I don't know if he'll be there consistently, but like that's kind of where I slot him in there, given arm talent, athleticism, decision-making, leadership. That team, the that team's the youngest team in the NFL, right? And he's the leader there. Like I, I think that there are elements there of Jordan Love, which I think are very positive, but I don't think they're out of the woods yet. Now, I think, I mean, to his credit, the fact that when things were rough, he didn't, you know, just pull up his tent, right? Of course. I mean, he's working yeah. through it and he's showing he's showing increased, you know, and evolving as a quarterback and as a starter. What I've always said to you is where is he as a true leader, right? Not sure where that is. And that that won't yeah. just come after a half a season. That'll come with more adversity and more ups and downs, right? Which I which I think is a big thing to to determine whether a quarterback is one of those quarterbacks in the top five. And we'll see that in time. He has been so, impressive lately. So give him his due. I do. I'm so gun to your head though. Right. If you were, cause okay. A couple of questions I have you first, firstly, the quarterback position is a tough one because I think that the franchise deserves, and, and this is a credit to you, obviously, cause you guys drafted one quarterback and he was really good. The, I think the franchise deserves some of the credit and blame when a quarterback hits, right? And there's a, there's an element of if you put Zach Wilson on a different team, does this do better? All that kind of stuff. There are some quarterbacks who I don't think would be good independent of where they end up going. I think there are some quarterbacks who would be great no matter where they went. Think about a guy like John Elway. Think about a guy like uh, Dan Marino, et cetera. Do you – do you, how much – how much – of the match do you how much of the fact that Jordan Love went to Green Bay and got to sit for three years is a part of where he's going versus if he would have went somewhere and got like I believe firmly if he would have gone somewhere and had to play right away I don't know if he we'd be talking about him right now I don't believe so I think this has been vital for him he needed time for sure at a lot of levels he needed time to be around Aaron Rodgers whether they got along or not I can't even remember how that went but you got a chance to see, again, whether some people like it, some people don't personality-wise, you got a chance to see one of the elite quarterbacks who had leadership ability, who had confidence coming out of his you know, ears. And so that's a good thing for, for a young quarterback to see, just like he did himself, right? So yeah. to their credit, they, they're, they're doing good things that way. If he, if he stepped out the gate starting, I, I agree with you 100%. I think he's, in a, he's maybe not even around. Yeah. And so in the end, you say he's is up as five. I think he's more of a 10, 10 and nine guy. I, I think his upside is nine ish top end of that, that top 10. So given all those things and given the way the market in the NFL has shaken out, meaning if you're a comp competent starter, the, the starting point is 40 million, probably higher now. Wow. And with all the things you just said, which is that, the Packers deserve as much, if not more, of the credit for developing him. And we don't know what he'd be like if he went somewhere else. Like, think about Brock Osweiler, right? The Broncos had a number. Brock wanted a little bit more than that number. And they're like, see you later, right? And and it's not like the Broncos. The Broncos haven't made the playoffs since they let Osweiler go. I, this sounds so stupid now that we're saying it out loud. But it's not like the Broncos like were like the winners here, right? It was just like one of those where – both sides were kind of like, well, we have our number and we're going to go get it. And there was a team in Houston that made a market for Osweiler. So he left and the Broncos, you know, went with Trevor Simeon. And like, if you're the Packers, like, do you, do you do this? Or is it a, do we, do you franchise tag him? Do you kind of, because we saw what happened with Kirk Cousins in Washington when they kept franchise tagging him. And eventually that got, became attention. What do you do if you're the Packers here? Um, because it, it's not an easy decision, is it? It's not an easy, easy decision at all. I mean, my head goes to that franchise. I just do not know how you can come through this season unless down the stretch he does miraculous things uh, into the playoffs. I, I don't know. But again, you start talking $40 million to be a mid-pack guy or, or you know, solid mid-pack. I think that's how you phrased it. That's unbelievable. When when we signed Matt to 30 million, remember, that was the top salary. And, you know, we were considering him definitely in the top five, 
overall, of course, in the top five. He was around some great ones, as you mentioned. So I think you have to you have but to it, it left you with no room for error. Matt. And that and Matt's a much better player than Jordan Love, at least not right, like yeah. uh, given everything yeah, we know. Yeah. It it left you with almost no room for error, right? You couldn't, you know, and, and the one thing I get worried about when I'm looking at the Packers, and and I'm gonna go to over the cap here and just make sure that I'm I'm not talking out of out of <laughs> Uh, my rear end here about their cap, but like they don't necessarily have a great situation cap wise next year. Effective cap space in 2024 is a little bit uh, over 11 million. Um, you know, when you look at 2025, the Packers uh, again are, you know, they're, they're a little bit better off after that, but still not a top half of the league team in terms of effective cap space over the next two years. So, you know, usually when you get a young guy in the mix, and then, you know, you build up around him, you build like most of the time, a young quarterback is not dealing with getting rid of Devonte Adams. They're dealing with a Devonte Adams coming in a la Tyree kill for Tua, right? Where the guy's on a young deal and you get an older guy to come in. Like in some ways, Jordan Love has done a great job with a lot of young cheap players. Yes. But once you pay Jordan Love all that money, the players around him get younger and cheaper. And so does how much does that make him? We're just talking about. Zach Wilson and how he doesn't have an offensive line. He doesn't have this, that, and the other thing. It's like, well, doesn't that become more true about Jordan Love when the Packers back up the truck and pay him? Like, that's where I get a little bit nervous here because I just don't – I don't think there's a good solution here. I don't know if there's a right answer. And ultimately, these teams just end up paying their quarterback and dealing with it because it's so hard to find a guy that's any good, and I get that. And you look around the league and you're looking at, like, Baker Mayfield playing and Bryce Young, like – all these games with quarterbacks who stink, I get it, but it's like I just don't know. I and you have that experience. Like once that quarterback makes a certain amount of money, it just makes everything harder. That's a great point. I don't know how much further we can go on it, but it's a great point. And how does how does a, a management group and a head coach sit down and really deal with this? I mean, Brian Gutekinds, as you know, as well as Matt Lafleur. Um, you know, they're going to have to sit down and decide on what's going to be best for the team. I'm looking at, at this depth chart right now. I mean, there's no one, I mean, these guys are all midline guys for sure. Right. Forties and fifties, as far as projected rankings, I'm yeah. talking about the receivers. I'm talking about talking about a tight end. Well, I mean, offensive line, David Bakhtiari, like, you know, yes. they've done it mostly without him this year. Like there's a, some that. impressive elements to what they're doing, but they they need a cor- they need corners they need a pass rusher opposite uh Preston Preston uh, not Preston Smith but uh uh Rashawn Gary they need I mean they need some players on that team to round it out the reason that they're six and six and in the playoff race Thomas seventy seven percent chance to make the playoffs is the NFC is bad yeah like right. you That's you right. re-rack the NFC and build the talent up on that level this roster is not a playoff roster yet. But because the NFC is so down and you have quarterbacks like Cousins are hurt, all this kind of stuff, like that's how they're in. But like that's not sustainable. And the same thing for the Giants, right? The Giants last year had the easiest schedule in the NFL, make the playoffs, win a game, all this kind of stuff. They re-rack it. Their schedule is twice as hard. And now we, you know, the life gets so much more fair. Um, speaking of the life getting fair, I want to transition briefly because we only have like eight to ten minutes left. Eagles get drilled by the Niners and the Eagles just went out and signed Shaq Leonard. who used to be called Darius Leonard, the linebacker from the Colts, one of the best linebackers in the NFL, a big contract, all this kind of stuff. And it's really funny because I want to, I want to throw a team building idea by you. Cause I think if you ever, you know, if, if, you know, we're ever running a team one day or whatever, I kind of want to throw this by. You. So the Eagles do a really good job of what I call money balling the NFL. You can get linebackers, you can get safeties, you can get guards, you can get running backs for almost nothing. They trade a fifth round pick for DeAndre Swift. He's like a top five rusher in the NFL this year. They go get Zach Cunningham, uh, Nicholas Morrow, Kevin Byard. All those guys are they got for nothing. Play some of these what are called non-premium positions, which are like position you can't get a left tackle for nothing. You can't get a wide receiver. So they go in the draft and they get these guys in the draft, right? Their, their team building is phenomenal, I think. However, the 49ers have built an offensive system that attacks ruthlessly these positions. And so a team like Philadelphia, it's sort of like in Moneyball where Billy Bean said, my shit doesn't work in the playoffs. (laughs) Yes. The Eagles have this like really amazing way of winning 13 games roster-wise. 
but they get up against a team like the Niners that stresses your linebackers, stresses your safety, stresses the non-premium positions, and it was a bloodbath yesterday. And so I'm wondering, are the Niners on to something where they attack the parts of the – like they attack these positions that most teams, even the smart teams, and the Eagles are one of the smartest, yep. slough off on – to where you have Nicholas Morrow up against Christian McCaffrey in space all game. You have tight end Kittle against Bayard. You have Debo Samuel running that tunnel screen. And just like now your best players are on their worst players. And I feel like that's a hidden edge that the 49ers have. You know, matchups, right? Yeah. Keep coming back to matchups, matchups, matchups. And, and we've said this. I mean, Kyle – Shanahan is a really, really good, smart coach, utilizes his talent, whether it's midline talent, whether it's, you know, a- adequate talent or the next level up, but it's not great talent. I think he does a great job putting his offense in the spot, you know, to, like you said, match against the talent that that needs to be matched against. And look, you know my feeling about Philly. I mean, they are the, one of the, if not the smartest teams in the way that Howie approaches things. How he's excellent at what he does, and he also puts the right people around him, other really good scouting minds and team builders, with a head coach that I think is really, really showing some amazing talent to him. I usually don't throw around words like that. I really like that organization. And yet I was really surprised to see San Fran do what they did. And it, it blows me away, quite honestly. And why was that? Is it is it just best for them to go in? I've said this all along. I think Philly's got everything. Most balls are bouncing their way, right? I think you have to have the balls bounce your way to be at the Super Bowl team. And I've been saying all along this year, like this is their year for that reason. And yet this just kicks me right in the shins, right? Like, holy shit, did this really happen? Excuse my language. So I'm, I'm just, I agree with you at a lot of levels. And I think again, what, what, what John Lynch has done there by providing John Lynch and Adam Peters providing, you know, Kyle with the right team and the right players to match up, I think is a very, very smart way to approach it. And they'll continue to do that well, though, as you know. Anyway, so we don't I don't know if we need to talk any more about it, but the no, reality I, is I, it's a cool, it's a cool matchup situation. Yeah, for sure. And I think look, like that yesterday was the fifth consecutive game that the Eagles trailed at halftime. Like that's not sustainable, right? That's not, you know. That's a good point. When a team lives on the edge, you know, you know, you can come back and beat Kansas City, but they needed a drop touchdown. Um, you know, that Dallas game was a comedy of errors by the Cowboys inside the red zone. You probably, you know, right now, Thomas, would you be surprised? Like the Cowboys, you know, face the Eagles on Sunday night next week at home. Cowboys are three point favorites. So this is the second consecutive week that a 10 10- 10 and one, 10 and two. This was the latest into a season, a 10 win team, a 10 and one team was underdogs at home playing their own, their regular starting quarterback. There was the Cardinals year where Carson Palmer got hurt and all that stuff. But like it, yeah, I mean, like, I think when you grade out the players, the Eagles just have some weaknesses. Now they have a quarterback in Jalen Hurts who was hurt for a little bit yesterday who can overcome a lot of those things. And they have some edges like the tush push and all these things where they, they, they push the boundaries of acceptable football, but it, it's, I think that they're firmly kind of below Niners, maybe even Dallas, I think Kansas city, Baltimore, like those teams, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see Jacksonville tonight, but like, I think the Eagles are maybe a second tier team, even though their record is obviously the best in the NFL, there's a step below. Now, the funny thing is, is, and this is, this should come for Eagles fans. It's, always like second tier teams win the Super Bowl all the time, right? Like they always, you know, they're, they're a team that, uh, you know, can still win the Super Bowl, even though they have, you know, I think uh, reasonable flaws. Second tier. It's tough for me. What is your definition of second tier team? Well, would they be, would they be favored? So are there teams that would be definitively favored against them if they were to play on a new in the Super Bowl? So like, I think the Niners now that they won't play each other in the Super Bowl, they're the same conference. The Niners would be favored against the Eagles. The Cowboys would be favored against the Eagles. The Chiefs and the Ravens, I think, would be favored against the Eagles. So that's kind of how I, I do it. Like, if they were to play each other, would the betting markets make the game a pick em or worse? And I, I think the Eagles would be underdogs against four or five teams in the NFL if they were to play tomorrow. Wow. I guess I didn't see it that way. I thought they were 
you know, those are the two teams. I mean, when you watch what, you know, I don't have their stats right in front of me. I, I know that San Fran is, aren't they number one in offense and defense right yeah. now? San Fran was favored yesterday on the road by a few, by a full yeah. field goal, which means that the market makes the Eagles about, and now there's rest differentials. The Niners are play, played on Thursday the week before. So the market gives them like a half a point or whatever, a quarter of a point. But like, the, if you're an underdog by a field goal, like last year, Kansas City was a field goal underdog at home to the Bills and lost that game. And, and and so, like, you could have even made the case for most of last year that Kansas City, the Super Bowl champion, was a second-tier team because a team like Buffalo was favored against them at home. And so, like, that's kind of how I do it. That doesn't mean that's immutable, right? And, and teams can obviously change. I mean, you get a couple – like the Niners lost three straight games when Debo and Trent Williams and all those guys were out. Like the Niners are more sensitive to injuries than any team in the league because they're not quarterback centric, but it, at full strength, I think the Eagles are, are a, a step beneath the Niners. I think significantly. Yeah. But, but okay. Which teams do you think would be favored over Philly right now? Dallas, San Francisco, Baltimore, and Kansas city. Huh? Okay, I would say I don't know about all those, but you're the better, so we'll we'll stay with you on the favors. Yeah, I don't um, know. I, just, I think I think we're being a little hard on. They had a bad game. I know, but I, but your point about halftime. I mean, there's something to that, right? They got to get that figured out. Um, but we've also seen Sam Fran have a couple crappy games, right? We have. Yeah, they lost to they lost to a backup quarterback in Cleveland. They lost to Cincinnati, who was kind of getting their bearings at the time. Yeah, no, I mean, there are no gods in the NFL. Everybody can everybody can be um, taken down. And I, I I mean, the last team, in my opinion, that was unbeatable was probably your Patriots in 0304. I think every other team, this is why we haven't seen a repeat champion in forever, because the league uh, I think values um a the league values a team. Uh, you know, values the fact that there are teams that can beat anybody. And I, I do think styles really make fights. I, I, I'm really interested to see how Sirianni's bunch comes back because Dallas on Dallas is getting a full week of rest too. This is a bad scheduling thing for the NFL. You know, they play the Niners off of a Thursday. They're playing the Cowboys off of a Thursday. So like the Eagles really got kind of screwed schedule wise over these next two games, playing two of the best teams in the league off big rest, like it'll be a big test for the, for the, and even when they got, they played off their bye. Kansas city was playing off their bye too. So the league did no favors yeah. to the Eagles this season schedule wise. And they're still 10 and two, which I think plays to, to their, you know, to how, how strong they are. I just think they're going to come back with a vengeance. Call me out on it next week. If they don't, I I'm excited for that. Um, yeah. Awesome. So this is uh this has been a great show. We, the numbers uh, have been great all show. We really appreciate you all coming in and, and commenting, um, you know, the league doesn't slow down uh, on, on Wednesday, Thomas and I are going to talk about some, some topics that are not necessarily, uh, you know, related to, um, you know, that the week at hand, but uh, obviously with so much content in the space, so centric on the games, uh, Thomas and I are going to bring a fresh perspective to some of the, the college to pro stuff, some of the quarterbacks that we're talking about now, um, you know, uh, what to look for during bowl season when you're looking for those next NFL players that are coming out. Uh, all great stuff. So, uh, you know, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, tell a friend about this show because uh, once we hit it big, you're going to be the one who uh, wants to be able to say, I knew about that first. So, for Thomas Dimitrov, for Eric Eager, this has been the Sumer Sports Show. <laughs>